morning, everyone. Welcome to the Wisconsin Counties Association's educational webinar this morning on parliamentary procedure, the advanced session. My name is Sarah Diedrich Kastorf. I'm the Deputy Director of Government Affairs at the Wisconsin Counties Association, and I will be serving as your moderator today. Um, I am not going to make very many uh, com opening comments this morning. As many of you may recall, this is a uh, promised follow-up from our March 29th webinar on parliamentary procedure, where we had an awful lot of, of questions from, from the audience, which was absolutely wonderful. And we just did not have time to get through everything. So what we are going to be doing today is, um, in a moment, I'll turn it over to Andy Phillips. Andy will go over a few slides on some advanced parliamentary procedure uh, concepts. And then we will spend the rest of the webinar um, opening it up to you for Q&A. So just in advance of our, um, our extended Q&A session today, I'd like to remind everybody that you can at any time throughout the webinar add your question either into the Q&A or into the chat function. And those are located in the bottom of your screen. Um, I will be monitoring both the chat and the Q&A function throughout the webinar and assist Andy in, in uh, getting through um, as many of the Q&A and chat questions as we receive in the time that we have allotted today. What I'll be trying to do is group questions um, that, are, that are somewhat related so that we can get to as many topics as, as possible. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our esteemed presenter today, Andy Phillips. Um, many of you already know Andy. Andy is, serves as our general counsel and is also attorney extraordinaire at Von Driesen and Roper. And for those of you who didn't know, that's his actual title that appears on their website. So with that, Andy, I'm just gonna turn it over to you right away so we can get started. Thanks, Sarah, and good morning, and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back, but I have to admit, I was telling Sarah earlier, I've never been so nervous for a webinar or a presentation, um, or at least I haven't been this nervous in many years because I have no idea what you guys are gonna ask me. So. Um, thought we'd start today in talking about some topics related to parliamentary procedure and some of these advanced issues, because part of it, have you part of our role here today is to take some of the mystery out of parliamentary procedure. I think for many, it can be an intimidating topic. And as I mentioned in March, when we got together, parliamentary procedure is designed as a shield, not a sword. It is designed to allow the majority to prevail, but also preserve the rights of the minority. And so when we talk about parliamentary procedure and its use, it's designed to create an environment where people can participate in meetings in a meaningful way. And also we can conduct business in an efficient and effective manner. And so if we take the mystery out of parliamentary procedure and all have an understanding of how it's supposed to work, that can help contribute to this environment that we're talking about running these effective and efficient meetings. So when we talk about parliamentary procedure, let's talk about today's objectives. Let's understand some basic terminology from Robert's rules. Again, let's take the mystery out of Robert's rules. And then finally, the objective is to make me a little bit foolish when I don't when I don't know the answer to a question or, I'll, or I'm wrong. And, and that's a very important point here um, because I don't claim to be an expert parliamentarian. Um, I know probably a little bit more than your average person, um, but I know enough of the terminology to be able to look at the very thick Robert's Rules book that I always have and find the answer. And so I don't know every answer off the top of my head, but more times than not, I can take a look at the book take a look at different things and figure out exactly how we're supposed to proceed under Robert's rules. So let's just talk very you know, high level. What are the five types of motions? And understanding these five types of motions will have you understand when a particular issue is in order, out of order, what takes precedence and so on. We have main motions. These are the motions that bring the business before the assembly. Somebody moves that the county buy a new highway truck. That's a main motion. It's called an original main motion. Um, in Roberts, they say that these are the types of motions that aren't described in Roberts Rules. Roberts Rules does not have a chapter on a county purchasing a highway truck. They have chapters on all of these other motions. So and when we're talking about the business of the body, that's called the main motion, the original main motion. And then we have subsidiary motions. Those motions assist the bodily, body in handling an original main motion or some other motion. For example, a motion to amend, that's a subsidiary motion. So if somebody moves that the county purchase 
a new highway truck and somebody moves to amend that motion to make it a red highway truck, then that amendment would be considered a subsidiary motion. Then we have a category of motions called privilege motions, and these deal with immediately pressing questions that are not directly relevant to the motion that's currently being considered. Privilege, meaning that there is something that needs to be taken up right away. Motion to take a brief recess, for example, unrelated to the topic of the original main motion, but we deal with that before we get to the actual um, handling of the original main motion. Then we have incidental motions. It, it affects how the body considers the current motion by changing rules of order, changing how we're going to deal with a particular situation as it relates to that original main motion. Um, but it is not considered a subsidiary motion. So the motion to suspend the rules to allow a matter to come before the body would be considered an incidental motion. And then we have a whole category of motions that are called restorative motions, or um, I forget what else they're called, but it's restorative motions so that a question that has already been disposed of by the body can come back before the body for consideration again. A motion to reconsider a motion to uh, take a matter up that was previously adopted. Those are, those are examples of those restorative motions. So let's start. We're just going to go down the list here and talking about these motions. And again, this is in Robert's Rules. And again, this is designed to give you the ability to take a look at Robert's Rules and understand how these motions fit within Robert's Rules and how they are applied to your particular situation within a meeting. So we start with these categories of subsidiary motions. We have uh, seven subsidiary motions. The first is to postpone indefinitely. That is a motion to say, we're not going to take this up. It's not a no vote on the motion. It just means you're gonna postpone consideration of this motion forever. In other words, it's an easy way to get rid of something that would otherwise be an uncomfortable debate or you don't necessarily want the body to take a public position on a particular item of business. So you move to postpone it indefinitely. I talked about the motion to amend previously. That's a subsidiary motion. The motion to commit or refer the matter to a committee, it sends it to a committee, either a special committee or a standing committee. The committee is charged with the responsibility of reporting back to the body following its referral and consideration of that particular topic. Moving the previous question, not call the question, moving the previous question, this ends debate. As we mentioned in the previous discussion in March, it requires a supermajority vote. It's a two thirds vote because it affects the rights of all members. And you're gonna see that as a consistent theme here. Remember, parliamentary procedure recognizes the will of the majority, but it also preserves and protects the rights of individual members of that particular body. Moving the previous question shuts off debate. It prohibits somebody from talking or debating further on a particular item of business before the body. And so it's going to require a supermajority vote to take away that right to speak. OK. Postpone definitely. We're going to postpone it to a definite time. And you're going to see this theme throughout Robert's Rules as well, is that Robert's Rules uses this term session throughout its rules. And the reason that it uses the term session throughout the rules is because that's an important concept to define. When can something be postponed? What does it mean if something is postponed indefinitely? When can I bring something back to the body? Things of that nature. All of the time limits associated with that aren't defined in terms of days, months, or years, but defined in terms of a particular session of the body. And so we often get the question, well, what is a county board's session? And there is nothing in chapter 59 of the Wisconsin statutes that outright defines what a county board's session is. Now, I think we all have an understanding that since we have an organizational meeting every two years, that it's logical to consider a session of the county board to be two years, and that's fine. And that's a good logical assumption, but there is nothing saying that that is the rule in Wisconsin. So we think it would be a good idea for a county board within its board rules to define what a session is. Because once you define what that session is, that then provides context for application of Robert's rules. For example, with postponing definitely, you can only postpone to a time within the present session of the county board, okay? And so again, having a definition of the term session helps. 
I've seen one set of county board rules, and I don't know how many others there are, defined a session as a current meeting. Now, I, I'm not going to say that's good, bad, or indifferent, but that does create certain problems if you want to postpone to a to the next meeting, because if your session ends, you know, Robert's rule says you can do it at the next meeting. So you do it at the next meeting. But if you postpone it for three months and you meet twice in that interim time period, technically under Robert's rules, the, it dies. That motion is dead because you have no ability to set something beyond the current or the next following session. So again, you'll see the word session. I've under lined it, highlighted it throughout this presentation a couple of times. It's an important concept to understand and it impacts your, your understanding and application of Robert's rules. Um, six subsidiary motion to limit or extend the limits of debate. Again, it requires a two thirds vote because you're taking away a member's ability to speak on a given topic. Motion to lay on the, type, lay on the table. Again, one of the most misused motions under Robert's rules. That doesn't mean you're going to take it up at the next meeting. It means you have to take it up at the current meeting. If it's not taken from the table by the end of the next session, it dies. Okay. So again, laying out on the table is a temporary measure to allow you to take care of other urgent business and then pull the matter that was on the table off the table back into debate and deal with it from a business standpoint. Okay. One other point on this session thing, because you'll see this used in Robert's Rules quite a bit, is that in Robert's Rules, I think that there is a strong presumption that a session is one single meeting. And one single meeting can extend for multiple days, but typically we're talking about a body that gets together, has a meeting, takes care of all business, and doesn't get together for a long period of time. That's not what we have with county boards. So I think you have to be careful in the interpretation and application of Robert's Rules to particular circumstances, which is why, again, it is so important to use your county board rules to try to, um, to, try to understand and better um, shape how it is that you want to conduct business at the county board level. I've, I've received questions from time to time, too, from folks saying, hey, look, our county board rules are out of compliance with Robert's rules. And I will tell you right now, there's no such thing as that. There's no such thing as that because county board rules are always going to take precedence over Robert's rules. Robert's rules recognizes that your county board rules, and Robert's refers to bylaws or other rules of the, of the deliberative assembly, rules of order that you can adopt, such as county board rules, taking precedence over Robert's rules. Then we're dealing with privileged motions. There are five privileged motions. Call for the orders of the day. That's somebody just requiring the chair to ensure that you are following the published agenda, that you are following the particular matters that are set forth on the agenda. It's used to keep the meeting in order. Um, note two on call for orders of the day, it doesn't require a majority vote. It doesn't require a vote of the assembly. It's the chair going ahead and enforcing the rules of order that are there for the, uh, for the body. Raise a question of privilege, uh, right to the body or certain members are sometimes raised. Uh, the chair might question uh, rules, whether it's a valid question of privilege, um, and the chair has the ability to always put it before the body. When I think about a question of privilege, I always think about, you know, that boardroom that all of a sudden becomes 87 degrees, it's too hot. Question of privilege, can we turn on the air conditioning so that we can cool down the room? And that's a question of privilege, and you can interrupt, and, and that matter takes precedence. Motion to recess, take a short break in the proceedings, allow us to have some time to, to catch our breath without disrupting the meeting, requires a majority vote. Motion to adjourn, it's a proposal to end the meeting, it requires a majority vote. Fix the time at which to adjourn the meeting, sets the time at which you're going to adjourn, um, and you can schedule another meeting uh, that's a continuation of the current meeting if, if necessary. And then we have 15 incidental motions. We have a point of order. A point of order is called where there's a breach of the rules, a breach of the agenda. You're not following the published agenda. Somebody can just, doesn't have to be, uh, again, a motion or a second. You just ask the chair, a point of order, Mr. Chair or Madam Chair, um, we're not following the agenda. We need to go back to item three. Um, the chair simply has to rule on a point of order. Appeal the ruling of the chair. An appeal brings the consideration of the chair's decision to the body. A majority vote of the body is required to overturn the chair's ruling. And this gets to a very important concept that I want to make sure everybody understands when it comes to parliamentary procedure and running effective meetings. Nobody 
nobody expects the chair or nobody should expect the chair to be the perfect parliamentarian. Nobody should expect corporation counsel to be the perfect parliamentarian. And so it's okay for somebody, if they raise a point of order, a point of parliamentary inquiry, something like that, for the chair to take a breath and consider what it is that that individual is asking the chair to do. And it's okay for the chair to consult with corporation counsel. And it's okay for corporation counsel to look at Robert's rules and figure out exactly how you're gonna deal with a particular matter of business. And then once all of that is done through careful consideration, you explain the position and then you make a ruling as the chair, the body has the right to appeal that ruling. And so understand that if, even if everything is wrong in terms of the analysis and everything, it still goes back to the body and the body gets to determine how are we gonna run this meeting? And so it takes a majority vote to overturn a chair's ruling on this. Motion to suspend the rules. And I see this happen quite often when it comes to the US Cong Congress, the state legislature and things like that is understand that those bodies have particular rules of order that they follow that are not entirely consistent with Robert's rules, okay? So when they talk about suspending their rules, they probably have their own considerations and their own process for suspending their own rules. When we talk about suspending the rules, we're talking about the rules of the governing body, the board, the board rules. That's exactly what we're talking about here with suspending the rules. One word of caution though, what is if your board rules are codified in ordinance, what is required in order to suspend the rules that are codified by ordinance? And there are a couple of different considerations there. If the ordinance provides for suspension of the rules, you follow that process within the ordinance. If the ordinance is silent, do you have the ability to supersede that ordinance through a motion to suspend the rules? I, I'm not gonna answer that question right off the top here, but that's a very important concept that you should confer with corporation counsel about because ordinances become the law of the land. Those are the law of the land as it relates to your particular county. And so if you don't have the ability to suspend the application of those county board rules that are in an ordinance, in that same ordinance, you have a particular legal question that again, corporation counsel would have to weigh in on. Personally, I would like to see with, if your county board rules are in ordinance, and I think it's a good idea to put those county board rules into an ordinance for a variety of reasons, that that ordinance also contain a provision calling for suspension of the rules in certain circumstances. And it's up to you what circumstances would apply to allow you to suspend those rules. Objecting to the consideration of a question. Note that this takes a two thirds vote. An objection to the consideration of the question means I don't even want this to get to debate. I don't even want this motion to proceed whatsoever. It requires a two thirds vote because you are taking rights away from somebody who is making that motion and you're taking rights away from others who may want to speak to that motion. So again, this is the type of motion that requires a super majority vote in order to pass. Call for division of the question. That's where you want to separate a motion into two or more separate motions. It requires a majority vote in order to divide that question. It goes hand in glove with considering a particular item seriatim or by paragraph, separate a lengthy motion into parts for debate and votes. And so you can think about consideration um, of uh, by paragraph and division of a question as two very related um, concepts. Note that both of them require only a majority vote, because again, you're not taking away anybody's uh, individual right to debate items within a motion. You're not taking away anybody's right to vote on a motion or anything like that. You're simply dividing a lengthy or complex motion or item of business into separate distinct parts. Call for the division of the assembly. Note, this doesn't require a vote, it's demand of a single member. It's usually used to question the result of a voice vote. and so. Um, if you have the eyes saying something, the nose saying something, and it sounds rather close, the chair makes a call, somebody can demand um, division of the assembly, and that's where you have to go to a different voting method to identify exactly how everybody's voting. There are motions related to methods of voting and taking polls. There are motions related to nominations, and so you use those um, 
Again, typically these require simply a majority vote. In certain circumstances, they may require a two-thirds vote, but typically when we're talking about process like this, again, it's not taking anything away from an individual member. It is merely establishing the process by which the body is going to consider how it's going to vote, how it's going to conduct a poll, um, how it's going to nominate certain persons, things like that. Request to be excused from a duty, you can request of the body that you be taken off as, for example, the first vice chair of the county board. Um, it requires a majority vote of the board. I think many people think that they simply get to resign from those positions and under Robert's rules, they don't. Now, that doesn't mean that you can force them to do it, but I always found this to be an interesting concept because theoretically anyways, somebody has to be excused from an obligation that the body has placed upon that individual. Um, I mentioned this before about parliamentary inquiry. Uh, you can question the chair about a particular application of the parliamentary rules or Robert's rules of order or the county board rules. And again, I think that when we talk about parliamentary inquiry here, you got to remember that there's a lot that folds into this, okay? Um, the reason I say that is that as Wisconsin counties, we are not only subject to Robert's rules, but we also have our county board rules. We also have state law. We also have federal law. And so when you're talking about parliamentary inquiry here, I would expand that to include any inquiry related to compliance with any provision of law. So for example, if somebody wants to take something up that isn't on the agenda, I move that we purchase a new, a new truck for the highway department. Um, somebody can raise a parliamentary inquiry and say, uh, Mr. Chair or Madam Chair, that matter is not noticed on the agenda. And I think we have an issue with the open meetings law and notice to the public about that particular item of business. That's a parliamentary inquiry, even though it's a state law open meetings law question. Point of information, request for information. Oftentimes we have department heads and others at these meetings with particular information regarding a particular topic that the county board is taking up. And so it's appropriate for a member to ask for uh, a point of information. Can I ask the department head to tell us how much does he or she anticipate this new truck for the highway department costing? That would be a point of information. Um, and again, there's no vote. The chair either answers the question or directs the question to somebody who can answer it. Um, 13, this is an important one because we talked about this in March as well. Remember, when we went through that nine-step process, we talked about who owns the motion at different points in time. And remember that when the motion is made and seconded and restated by the chair, that once restated by the chair, the motion belongs to the body. So the maker of the motion cannot simply withdraw the motion because the body owns that motion. It has to dispose of it one way or another. Well, in Robert's rules, there is a provision recognizing that if the maker of the motion wants to withdraw or change the motion, if it's already been stated by the chair, a majority of the body can allow the maker to withdraw or modify the motion. That's an important concept because remember, I said that the motion after made seconded and restated by the chair belongs to the body, but the body can consent to the maker of the motion withdrawing or restating the question. Again, it requires a majority vote from the body in order to do that. Request to read papers, that's recognized in Robert's rules. Remember, we said early on that there is no provision under Robert's rules that would allow somebody to stand up in a meeting and start reading ad nauseum from papers. There's nothing that allows somebody to do that. And I think that everybody understands that when we get into concepts related to debate and filibuster, those are congressional things, their rules, not Robert's rules. We don't have that type of debate filibuster type feature in Wisconsin county government, but we do have the ability for an individual to request the body the opportunity to read papers. And if a majority of the body allows that member to read from the papers, that member can certainly do so. Request for other privilege. It's used to make any request that's not defined by another incidental motion. Requesting to make remarks when no business is pending, for example, that would be some other privilege recognized in Robert's rules that somebody can request. And if the body approves, then that person can address the body without any sort of formal motion pending before that body. Restorative motions. These are the ones I talked about earlier about bringing business back before a particular body or assembly. There are five restorative motions. Rescind, okay, used to nullify an adopted resolution motion section or paragraph. 
And this is what's important too, is that if you look at rescind, amend something previously adopted, uh, reconsider, discharge a committee, things like that. Note that in Robert's rules, it says that it requires a majority vote if there's previous notice or a two thirds vote without previous notice. Well, when are we ever going to have a county board or county board committee meeting without previous notice? We're not. Open meetings law requires us to have previous notice. So does somebody have the ability to bring a motion to rescind or to amend something previously adopted or to reconsider if it is not on the agenda? And the answer is no, because the open meetings law requires us to inform the public about what's going to happen at this meeting. And so when we talk about the majority with previous notice or two thirds vote without previous notice, you're always going to have previous notice. It's always going to be majority and it's got to be on the agenda. If it's not on the agenda, then you can always make a motion that it be, it be included on the agenda for the next meeting. All right. But you cannot take it up at that current meeting unless it's on the agenda. All right. Again, amend something previously adopted. Same concept as, as rescind. Motion to reconsider. All right, it allows the body to take something up that it's already disposed of. It can only happen during the same session. There we see that session word again. So it's very important that we have an understanding of what a session of the county board and a county board committee is. This can only be made by someone who voted on the winning side of the original motion. That means if the motion failed, it's somebody who voted no. If the motion carried, it's somebody who voted yes. If it was a tie vote, that means the motion failed. And so it would have to be somebody who voted no on a reconsideration motion. Motion to take from the table requires a majority. Again, when we talk about laying on the table, that is a temporary measure to allow the body to take up other more pressing business. And so to take it from the table and back to the body for consideration, um, brings it back, requires a majority vote. Motion to discharge a committee and things like that. So I've spent about 25 minutes in very quick order trying to go through some of these different motions. And if you look at all of these motions, you're going to see them in Robert's Rules of Order. Each of them has significant discussion within Robert's Rules, but it's good to have an understanding of the verbiage that Robert's Rules uses. And the reason it's good to understand the verbiage is that when you take out your cheat sheet, that talks about order of precedence of all these various motions, you're gonna see that there are formal titles to each of these motions because you wanna figure out, well, what's in order at any particular time? And so when you look at all of these cheat sheets and have these things, then that's going to cue you in. So when you look at the index of Robert's rules, you know what you're looking for. Again, let's take the mystery out of Robert's rules and let's figure out, all right, I want to do this in plain English. How does Robert's rules Number one, what does Robert's Rules call this? And then number two, how does Robert's Rules treat that particular item of business? And so it's good to just have a comfort level with the terminology that Robert's uses. All right, we had a couple of questions submitted in advance. And so, Sarah, I'm going to go through these quickly before we get to the other questions that I know you've got in queue here. All right, somebody uses public comment period for personal attacks on county employees, department heads, or county supervisors. How do you deal with that? And that's a question that we've addressed uh, several times over the years. Public comment, if it's contained on an agenda, should not be used for ad hominem personal attacks on county employees, department heads, or county supervisors. What I would recommend, and I think it's a best practice, and I think it should be in your board rules if you're going to do this, is that you indicate public comment must be germane to the topics that are on the agenda for that particular county board or committee meeting. And the reason you do that is so that you can call somebody out of order when they start going out in left field on all of these different topics and issues that they want to raise that are completely unrelated to the business of the county board or the committee that particular day. Now, the other thing that I would suggest is something to consider is somebody's gonna say, well, what if a member of the public simply wants to say, hey, I think you should put this item on your agenda for the next meeting. You may want to consider that as being an exception to the rule that these particular comments be germane to the agenda. Under no circumstances is it appropriate for somebody to personally attack county employees, department heads, or county supervisors, but understand if we're going to limit public comment, that that implicates an individual's First Amendment rights. So we have to be careful about how we apply this rule in terms of saying somebody is out of order for these personal attacks, all right? 
just because somebody disagrees with the board chair or a member of the board or the board itself doesn't mean necessarily that it's a personal attack, all right? That individual has First Amendment rights and a freedom of speech and the ability to petition his or her government for redress. So we have to be careful about that. If you're going to implement these rules and when you apply these rules, if implemented, make sure you discuss with corporation counsel exactly how you're going to do that. Because again, there are First Amendment considerations. Um, somebody uses uh, public comment to promote unfounded alternative treatment methods or controversial websites. Again, if we can talk to and have county board rules that speak to this concept of public comment having to be germane to the particular agenda of the board or committee, we get rid of the personal attacks. We get rid of all of these statements about alternative treatment methods or controversial websites, all right? It has to be germane to the agenda. And that's what we're here to talk about. And it's perfectly appropriate for the board chair to enforce a rule that requires public comment to be germane to the agenda. Next, what about clapping, cheering, disruptive behavior during public comment? You have the ability to maintain order during a meeting and you have the ability to maintain order as the chair and as a parliamentarian by asking uh, that the person be removed. You have, you know, if it's disruptive behavior that's occurring during the meeting, you have the ability to kick somebody out of a meeting. Again, be judicious in this. It's not simply somebody um, uttering a peep and kicking them out of the meeting. But if an individual is going to be completely disruptive, you have the ability to call the sheriff and have the sheriff remove that person. Any thoughts on restricting comments to agenda items only for county board meetings or standing committee meetings? Yes, that's what I just talked about. I think that's a great thought. Should disagreements with county policies be more properly addressed through supervisors to be brought forward appropriately? Um, it depends. I've mentioned this before in the context of the roles and responsibilities presentation that we do from time to time for county boards and administration is that I want things that are addressed with the appropriate chain of command. In other words, county supervisors aren't individually responsible for being a complaint department, whether it be a member of the public or an employee. And so I'd rather see disagreements with county policy be addressed to the committee. How it gets to the committee? Good question. It can get to the committee through a department head. It can get to the committee through an individual board supervisor, whatever makes the most sense and is the most efficient for your particular county. However, I will emphasize that I think it is a lot more efficient that matters of policy be addressed by a committee as a whole or the county board as a whole, as opposed to any individual county board supervisor. All right. So now, and I, I, I want to give attribution to that whole presentation that I just went through on the different classifications of motions, slide to doc.com, they, they had a nice um, PowerPoint that went through all of these different motions. And I stole a lot of, I shouldn't say steal, I borrowed a lot of the content for all of this uh, presentation from that particular website. It's not anything earth shattering. It is all, as I mentioned, contained in Robert's rules with the different chapters, but I thought they did it in a very comprehensive and well thought out uh, format. So now we're on to questions and comments. And Sarah, are you going to ask me the questions? Or you want me to read them? Um, I can ask them, Andy. That's okay. That's good. Um, It'll allow me to take a drink of coffee. You can take a drink of coffee. I won't make you read them all. This first question, Andy, is actually something you and I just recently talked about, dealing with um, abstaining and abstention from voting. So can a supervisor abstain from voting on an issue, not because they have a conflict of interest, but because the supervisor does not want to take a stand on a controversial issue. Um, Robert's rules, if I remember correctly, says there has to be some reason for an abstention, um, but it's not specific. Robert's rules is not specific as to what that reason has to be and what needs to happen in terms of making that reason known. Um, but like in other circumstances I discussed earlier, there are legal considerations with a particular member taking a particular position on a particular agenda topic. Um, ethics and conflicts of interest rules come into play. And so if there is um, an ethics or conflict of interest concern that an individual member has, and that individual member believes that abstention is going to resolve that concern, make a record of it. Make sure that the chair and the body knows why you are abstaining 
from discussion, debate, and vote on a particular issue. That way, if somebody ever looks back at the minutes and accuses you of engaging in business you shouldn't have been because of an ethics or conflict of interest issue, you can point to the minutes and the minutes will reflect your abstention. Now, in normal circumstances, I think it's good to have a county board rule in place that talks about process for abstention. And that is to, again, make sure that you have a record for those conflict of interest or ethics situations. But as well, if you have that rule in place, it is far too easy for somebody to simply just abstain. And realistically, I think county board supervisors are put in their seat to take action, to actually engage in debate and to take votes and, in other words, represent their constituents. And so I think that is incumbent upon a public servant to serve the public and take those positions absent some circumstance under the law that either requires or strongly counsels uh, abstention. So I think it'd be good to address that topic in your county board rules. All right, Andy, we got a couple of comments with regard to that yet before we leave this topic. Um, couple, first is, uh, what about if you think someone else has a conflict? And the second um, references a Madison City Council case. Okay, and what if somebody else thinks you have a, a conflict? That's a great question. Let's say that um, you know that a particular supervisor's spouse is angling to get a contract with the county and the county board is about to approve that contract. And that particular supervisor has not abstained from debate, discussion, and voting on that particular contract that's at the county board level. What do you do as an individual supervisor? I think it's incumbent on you to raise it as a point of order or point of parliamentary inquiry and ask the question of the board chair about that particular conflict or ethics situation. Perhaps the board chair and corporation council aren't aware of this potential conflict of interest. And it's important that board chair and corporation council be allowed the opportunity to evaluate the conflict or ethics question because one of the remedies that is available if somebody engages in conduct that's a violation of the ethics rules or a conflict of interest, one of the remedies is voiding that particular contract. And so the county if it's taking a vote on it, if it approves the contract, thinks obviously the contract is a great deal, but may not get the benefits of that great deal if you have participation from a member with a conflict of interest. So raise that point as a parliamentary inquiry or point of order and make sure the board chair and corporation council are aware. They may be aware. If you raise that inquiry and ask the board chair, if the board chair is aware, corporation council say, yes, so-and-so member came and talked to me about this. It's not a conflict of interest for these reasons, but then everybody knows, but raise that issue. Okay, do you wanna address the Madison City Council case, the first amendment analysis, Andy? What happened in the Madison City Council case? I'm not aware. Um, is that the case where a member chose not to vote and there was, you, you, I, I recall there was participating in a, in a, and maybe not you, and maybe it was something we did with um, UW Extension, um, talking about the fact that uh, uh, somebody, you cannot compel somebody to vote. No, you can't compel somebody to vote. I mean, you can't throw them in a jail for not voting. Um, and they have a first, I, I mean, theoretically, would they have a First Amendment right to abstain? I'm mean, Sure. And that gets back to this whole concept that we're talking about with having an abstention procedure within your county board rules. Now, remember, just because you have an abstention procedure within your county board rules, um, somebody declares that they're going to abstain from this vote and the reasons why, then it's up to the bo body, I guess, to determine if those are valid reasons. But you can't hold a gun to somebody's head and say you have to vote. You can't do that. Um, and so um, I would hope that if we put processes in place, dealing with abstention, dealing with identifying potential conflicts or ethics issues, that we all go through this process with open eyes and we get to the right result. Now, the right result isn't guaranteed, but the more we can have discussion about this, the more we can have disclosure, and the more that we can have an open and transparent way of dealing with these situations, the less likely we're going to get to those ugly situations. But I have not read the Mad Madison City Council case. I'd have to take a look at that um, to see exactly what the boundaries are on a First Amendment right to abstain. All right. Thanks, Andy. And I know if Mike Blasco were here, Mike Blasco would talk about 
you're there to represent your constituents and you may would have an obligation in his mind to vote. But again, based on this case, they would talk about, you know, they can't, as you say, they can't hold a gun to your head. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think we're good on, on the issue of abstentions. I think I've addressed all the questions related to that. Um, so let's talk about, Andy, there was a question, I think a clarification with regard to the motion to uh, postpone indefinitely. They have table indefinitely here, but I think they're really referencing to postpone indefinitely. Can that be made as a made motion or can that be only made as a subsidiary motion to after somebody moves adoption? It's okay. Postpone indefinitely means that there's an item of business currently on the floor that somebody wants to get rid of indefinitely. That's the motion to postpone it indefinitely. So that motion is in order only when there is other business pending before the body. And so if you look at the order of precedence as it relates to the motions chart that I spoke about earlier, somebody brings a main motion and then everything on that order of precedence above that main motion is in order. And the motion to postpone indefinitely is above that um, in that order of precedence. And so you can't postpone something indefinitely unless there is something on the floor currently being considered. There's nothing to postpone. So um, the more appropriate thing is that more appropriate motion, if you will, if you don't want anything even getting to debate, you don't even want to wait to be recognized to make a motion to postpone indefinitely is to raise an objection to the consideration of the question. And again, with a two thirds vote, then that question isn't even considered by the body. So again, uh, objecting to the consideration of the question is a way to get some, rid of something really, really quick without having to wait for a motion to postpone indefinitely. Thanks, Sandy. I was taking notes on that one because that's something I hadn't heard before, the objection to the consideration of the question. I'm sure we're um, going to get a lot of that here in the next couple of months as people try that. <laughs> exactly. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> okay, so here's the here's the next question, Andy. Again, um, we were, we were it just asked once again if you could talk about moving the previous question and explain that once again. So moving the previous question, again, that cuts off debate. And oftentimes I'll be sitting in a meeting and I'll just hear somebody shout out from back, call the question. That does nothing. You can't just shout out, call the question. Call the question isn't even a recognized motion under Robert's rules. It's just one of those misconceptions that's been around for years and years and years. It's called moving the previous question. And so again, when we look at the order of precedence, um, moving the previous question is above once it's in debate. And so you can move the previous question to shut down debates and that requires a two thirds vote. Now, what I will tell board chairs is that if you've got a lot of people that want to be recognized to speak and debate on a particular topic, and you have, for example, the second speaker say, I think that we should never ever purchase a new highway truck. So I'm gonna vote no on this motion to purchase new highway truck. And I move the previous question. And somebody else shouts out second. Is the chair required to consider that motion in order? No, the chair is not required to do that. And this is another concept that's buried in Robert's rules, but it's actually, it's a good concept. It's, the, it's called dilatory motions. In other words, if somebody is attempting to use parliamentary procedure as a sword, as, oppo as opposed to the shield, then you have the ability as the chair to just not recognize that particular motion. If somebody says, and I move the previous question, and somebody shouts out second, the chair can say that that motion is out of order at this particular time. We have a lot of people wanting to engage in debate. I will not recognize that motion. Now, what happens if that member says, well, wait a second, I, I, I made that motion. I have a right to have it heard. Well, you can appeal the ruling of the chair in that circumstance. And so Robert's rules always gives us the ability to get the decision back into the hands of the assembly. But I can tell you that I would say in 99.9% .9 of the circumstances, if we've got a whole list of people wanting to speak to a particular motion or item of business, that that chair's ruling is not going to be overturned. All right, Andy, uh, next question is on the privileged motion to adjourn. Is a motion to adjourn always in order? For example, may a member use it to try to shut down a meeting with a controversial issue further down the agenda for the purpose of gathering support for his or her position at a future meeting? That's a great question. So if we look at the order of precedence on the motions, remember, the higher on the order of precedence, the greater precedence it's going to take over whatever else is pending before the body. The top number one thing that takes precedence is the motion to adjourn. And so 
yeah, you can move to adjourn and get rid of everything having to do with that particular meeting. All right. So can you interrupt somebody and make a motion to adjourn? No, you have to wait your turn. You have to be recognized by the chair. Does a motion to adjourn require a second? Yes, it does. Important part. Is it debatable? No, it's not, unless your county board rules provide that it's debatable. And I think Mike would always tell us, Sarah, too, that in Dane County, the motion to adjourn was a debatable motion according to their county board rules. And so unless your county board rules say that it's debatable, it's not a debatable motion. Can you amend the motion to adjourn? No, no, because again, fixing the time at which to adjourn, that falls lower on the table, okay? The motion to adjourn is the highest and it requires a majority vote to carry. So the motion to adjourn is a very, uh, it's a very powerful motion. All right, Andy, let's talk about uh, point of personal privilege. Is that truly a motion? And if so, how would one use it? Point of personal privilege? I mean, that's, again, to take up something that would be personal to the member. Um, it's a question of privilege. You can interrupt. Um, you just raise that issue. The example that I used was the meeting room. Uh, the temperature in the meeting room is too high, and so you want to turn on the air conditioning unit, things of that nature. And so it's, it's truly incidental. It doesn't have to do anything with the business that's before the body. It should not be misused. Again, this whole concept of dilatory motion practice is highly, highly discouraged in Robert's rules. And so if you've got somebody just continuously raising these questions of personal privilege and things like that, rule them out of order and ask them to conform their conduct according to Robert's rules and the county board rules. Um, but yeah, there's, it, there's a way to do that. Question of personal privilege, uh, Madam Chair, may I be excused to use the restroom? That's a question of personal privilege. Yes or no? Sure. So yeah, you can raise that at any point. All right, Andy, can a committee chair make a motion and take action that has not been listed on the agenda? No. No, that's a simple one. Open meetings law says we can't do it. Okay, Andy, someone wants to know, how do you find Robert's rules? Or how do bodies typically refer to them? Is it a handbook? Is it online? How, how do you find Robert's Rules? If you go to Amazon, they have all of those. If you, Robert's Rules actually maintains a website if you type Robert's Rules into a Google search or whatever other search. Um, currently, it's the 12th edition of, it's called the Rules of Order Newly Revised. And so R-O-N-R -R is what you often see as the, as the abbreviation. It's a thick book. It really is. But it's, um, like I said, it's quite comprehensive. And, and it's very helpful to have that. At the very least, your board chair and corporation council should have the latest copy of it. But I think you can find a copy of it just by going to Amazon and typing in R-O-N-R -R or Robert's Rules. I was going to say, I, I go to Amazon to purchase my copies. And also, too, I would just mention there is an in-brief version. Um, for those of you that might be very new to utilizing this, this just kind of simplifies, and it's a bit of an easier read than everything that's in this much thicker 12th edition, which is hundreds and hundreds. It's 700 pages long. Well, so yeah, and starting out and wanting to learn a little bit, I think this, this in-brief version, I think I find find somewhat helpful. Yeah, the in-brief version is great. I didn't get it um, because I typically don't get asked the really easy questions, Sarah. So I have to go to the, <laughs> I have to go to the big book and half the times I've, I've fumbled through that as well. But I think you're absolutely right. There's that in-brief and there is also a Robert's Rules for Dummies book that's out there, um, consistent with all of the other four dummies books that are out there. Type that into Amazon because that's a good resource as well. All right, next question, Andy. When the maker of a motion adds or subtracts from a motion, is it okay to ask the body for unanimous consent? All right, so the maker of the motion wants to add or subtract from the motion. If the motion is made, seconded, restated by the chair, who does it belong to? It belongs to the body. So the maker of the motion needs permission from the body to add to or subtract from that particular motion. You can always do anything by unanimous consent because if it's unanimous consent, then the body is, there's unanimity on how you're gonna deal with it. So let's take the highway truck. Uh, I move we purchase a highway truck. Second, chair restates, motion before the body is to purchase a highway truck. Anybody want to debate? And then the maker of the motion says, oh, wait, darn, hold on a second. I want to make it a red highway truck. Chair can say, is there any objection to the main motion now stating the county shall purchase a red highway truck? 
Hearing no objection, we are going to consider that the main motion. That's unanimous consent. But as soon as somebody says, I object, one single person says, I object, then the chair needs to put the question to the body. Is the body, can I have a show of hands or all in favor of uh, somebody at the maker of the motion being allowed to add the word red into the main motion, please say aye. And you go through that process and it requires a majority vote. All right, next question deals with motions that bring a question before the assembly again. Mm -hmm. In this instance, it looks like the county had a resolution passed committee five nothing, failed at the county board meeting 10 to 14. All the committee members were on the losing side. So where does this lie? Who, who can bring the motion back? One of the 10 that lost, or excuse me, it's one of the 14 that won. It's uh, on the winning side that has to reconsider. So it would be one of the 14 that voted no. And Andy, when is it appropriate to do so? Is it at the next meeting? Can it be three meetings? See, and this is, when, this, when, does yeah. that, when does that happen? Because I know that tends to be a question we get asked. Yeah, that's where it gets complicated again, talking to Corporation Council about this, because there is also a concept within Robert's rules that as soon as the body has taken action consistent with the adopted measure or the adopted resolution, action in furtherance of implementation of the resolution or the adopted measure, then a motion to reconsider is inappropriate. And let's take the highway truck example there. Let's say that the body, uh, the county board, approves purchasing a new highway truck. In reliance upon that particular measure or resolution, the county enters into a contract with Ford Motor Company to purchase the new truck. It's a binding contractual commitment and it was authorized by county board resolution. It's too late then to reconsider, all right? Because the county has already taken steps to implement what had been approved. So it's too late at that point to reconsider. The other issue is that there is this concept of passage of time, and that's where that word session comes in to Robert's Rules, is that after a period of time, Robert's Rules is going to say that the motion to reconsider itself is out of order. And so Robert's Rules defines it as current session or next session. Well, if you define the session as two years for the county board, does that mean you can bring up a motion to reconsider business at the next two-year period for something that happened early on in the two-year tenure of the previous session? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I think it depends on the circumstances. But that's getting a bit into the weeds as it relates to the particular motion that's being considered and the county's reliance upon that particular motion in order to chart its course of action, if you will. So consult with Corporation Council on that one. All right, Andy, I think this next question references public hearing, but I'm wondering if it, it if it's in a reference more so to public comment. Um, can or should board members uh, make comment, clap, stand in favor? Um, you know, in essence, how, how should a county board member conduct themselves during the public comment period? Um, I would prefer, and I think Corporation Council would agree with me on this, hopefully they would, that um, the county board members remain very stoic during, during public comments, that it's um, inappropriate to um, depart from the regular rules of decorum that apply to the county board. And so I would, I would recommend that county board members re remain stoic and that it would be, I would consider it to be inappropriate for county board members to either show uh, very publicly either support or disdain for a particular comment made during a public comment period. Andy, I know we get questions on this as well, so I have a follow-up for you on this. Is it okay for a uh, public board member to engage during public comment period? Can they ask for clarification as to what the individual is talking about? Is that appropriate? If the item that they're discussing is not on the agenda, is it inappropriate for a board member to comment at all? I know we've gotten lots of questions over the years with regard to to just what level of engagement is appropriate, if at all? Uh, no, I, that's a good question. You're right. We do get that question quite a bit. And technically speaking, board members should not engage whatsoever during public comment. But I think that there are probably some exceptions to that where, according to your example, can they ask questions to try to clarify certain things that are, that are being said uh, during public comment? 
And when you look at this whole concept uh, under open meetings law, I'm looking for it right now in statute, there is a provision that says that it's not a violation of the open meetings law to respond to public comment, even if it's not on the agenda. Um, but I, I would use that incredibly sparingly because that exception is not designed to allow the public body to engage in debate about a matter that's raised in public comment. And so I'd be very, very careful about doing anything as it relates to responding to public comment. If anything, the question should be directed to the chair and the chair can confer with corporation counsel as to the appropriateness of asking a question and asking for additional information or otherwise responding to the particular issue raised in public comment. At least we have a process for making sure that corporation counsel is aware and corporation counsel that can make a determination of compliance with open meetings law and engaging in that course of conduct. Okay. Uh, question now with regard to setting of agendas. Again, something we get quite often. Who is in charge of setting the agenda, Andy? Technically, it would be the board chair or committee chair in consultation with the county clerk. It's not entirely clear under Chapter 59 or Chapter 19 exactly how that works. And so we typically see that there are local rules, county board rules that deal with setting the agenda. Um, I would very much prefer that a county have a county board rule that defines who sets the agenda and what the process for the agenda is. But again, if we look at Robert's rules and we look at the rules of procedure in chapter 59 about a county board, the board controls the agenda. And so if somebody wants to demand something be placed on the agenda and a majority of the supervisors agree, the board chair and the clerk have an obligation to put it on the agenda. Um, the way that you do that is there's a, either a petition process, I think it's in 59.14, uh, if I remember right, um, or there is also a process whereby you can ask that an item be placed on the agenda for the next meeting, because again, you want to comply with the open meetings law. But to the extent possible, I would very much prefer that it be addressed in the county board rules because arguments about who has the right to put something on the agenda don't really move the ball forward. I'd like everybody to be able to get down to the very important business of the county board as opposed to spending days arguing about who has the right to put something on the agenda. All right, Andy, uh, the concept of committee of the whole. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about committee of the whole? Um, this county in particular asking the question during their board meeting, they always convene to a committee of the whole for a portion of the meeting. Um, so what is committee of the whole? What, it, what is different when your county board meets as a committee of the whole as compared to the county board convening for its regular session? Many of the whole is typically used just to have debate and discussion about a particular item of business without taking official action. In theory, the committee of the whole is to allow spirited debate to occur, to allow the county board to the, then determine after coming out of committee of the whole, how it's going to um, deal with a particular item of business. And the reason that you use committee of the whole is that the particular issue is not at the stage where somebody can make emotion. We don't have enough information. or We haven't really addressed the topic well enough for somebody to make a motion. And so the committee of the whole is used to further identify what the issues are to allow somebody to take a particular position and make a motion, which can then be debated and acted upon by the body. I've seen different counties adjourn to committee of the whole, and that's fine and that's good. And I think a lot of counties use that really as an open forum to talk about a particular agenda item without commitment to a particular course of action. I mean, when you think about it, a resolution comes to the county board, you debate the resolution, and the resolution either passes or fails or is amended, you know, you know or referred to committee, something like that. If you don't have a resolution and it's just a general topic, you may want to adjourn to the committee of the whole to have a discussion about that general topic. You don't take official action as a committee of the whole, and then you come out of the committee of the whole, and that's going to inform the county board going forward. All right. I'm looking here at the interest of time. I'm just going to look, I'm looking at some questions here before we go back to folks where we've already ad addressed some of these issues. Um, let's talk about... Um, Let's see here. Oh boy, lots of questions. Still on abstentions, it seems, Andy. Um, should a supervisor preclude himself from discussion and debate on an issue if they plan to abstain? That's a great question. It depends on why you're abstaining. I mean, if you're going to abstain and you know you're going to abstain, then don't then don't engage in debate. It's the difference between should and shall. I mean, is there a rule requiring you to? No, but I mean, you probably should because 
um, you're not even going to take an official position on a particular issue. All right, another question on abstention. Robert's Rule Section 45 provides that there is a right to abstention. I understand that the vote is counted differently if the abstention is due to conflict as opposed to no reason given. Is that correct, Andy? What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you're right. Robert's Rules does recognize abstention as a right. There's no doubt about that. But what I was talking about earlier, and I want to clarify this, is the obligation or duty as a, as a public servant and how that's a little bit different than, a, for example, a corporate board of directors or some other organization's board, just different concepts. Um, but second, is it different if we've got a conflict situation or some other reason for abstention? Is the vote counted differently? It depends. It depends on the particular requirements for that vote. There are some votes under statute that require a majority of the board counting all members that are entitled to a seat. And so, for example, if you've got a 25 member board and you've only got 20 people there at a particular meeting, it's a quorum. And under normal rules, it would take a vote of 11 in order for the matter of business to pass because 11 out of 20 is still a majority. But there are certain issues that require a majority of the county board entitled to a seat, in which case you would need 13. And so the abstention would count differently in that circumstance than it would under a normal circumstance. And so it really depends upon the particular facts and circumstances um, in a particular situation, which again, you should talk to corporation counsel about and make sure you have an understanding when you're going into a vote. And that's the other, the duty of the chair is to make sure everybody understands how a vote goes. And so I think the board chair needs to tell the body a yes vote does this and no vote does this. And here's what happens with abstentions. And so I think having that discussion before everybody votes would be very helpful. Okay, and to answer one question, will this be available on the WCA website? Yes, we will post Andy's uh, PowerPoint as well as a copy of this recording on the WCA website. Andy, a couple of questions with regard to board members and public comment. Um, so there's two questions here related to that. First, can a member of the board refuse to take their seat and make comments as a member of the public. And then there's the second one with regard to the same issue, but instead a county board supervisor um, attending a committee a meeting that that uh, board supervisor is not a member of that particular committee. How does that board member uh, participate in that committee meeting? Do they need to register um, at the start of the meeting? Um, and indicate that they would wish like to address the committee as part of the public comment period for that committee? Or how, how do I engage as a supervisor when I'm not a member of our particular committee? So two questions all about supervisor participation in public comment. No, I, those are great questions. And I think it again highlights the importance of addressing some of these topics in your board rules. Let me start with the second part of the question, which was board supervisor participation in committee meetings when board supervisor is not a member of the committee. Board supervisor has First Amendment rights just like anybody else. So I would have concerns about limiting board supervisor's ability to, to engage in public comment if it's on the agenda and the committee allows it, just like anybody else in the public. And so if we're going to limit it based upon somebody's um, status as a board supervisor, either they should have the ability to address the committee separate and apart from public comment, or we give them the same rights as the general public under public comment. And if we're giving them the same rights, they have the same obligations. They state their name, their address, and things of that nature in their comments. If we have board rules like this, our comments have to be germane to the particular agenda topics. The first part of the question related to, can somebody refuse to take their seat? Again, I'd like to see a board rule on this, but let's talk about this in theory. Somebody could show up to a meeting and they're not going to take their seat. They're going to public comment. Then they're going to take their seat. Well, they're considered absent from the meeting until we get done with public comment and then they go. And theoretically, they should have the ability to address the body and the board chair from their seat as a supervisor. So I have no idea what advantage they would be gaining by doing it that way. I suppose under Robert's rules, they could do it that way, but I certainly don't think that's a best practice. And I certainly think we ought to do what we can to discourage that. Okay, Andy, can a supervisor get a revote on a resolution from a previous county board meeting? How is that handled? Those are the restorative motions. We talk about rescission, we talk about reconsideration and things like that. In certain circumstances, you can get that revote, but there are particular rules 
that come into play there. So I would encourage you to take a look at the chapter in Robert's Rules discussing restorative motions and how you bring something back before the body that the body has already disposed of. What if it's, Andy, not the body wanting to reconsider the full thing? But say I, I feel I voted incorrectly or my vote was recorded incorrectly. Well, if your vote was recorded incorrectly, you want to do what you can to uh, correct the error. But again, I mean, if you look at that circumstance, um, Robert's Rules deals with correcting uh, previous votes and things like that. You've got to be careful about that, especially if it's going to impact the outcome of a particular vote. And there are certain time limits on this. And so if we go through a county board meeting, a resolution is adopted and nobody says boo about their vote being recorded incorrectly, then you get to the next meeting and the person says, oh, my vote was recorded incorrectly. Is that going to be in order? Probably not, um, because you should have raised that point in the previous meeting. But again, there are particular circumstances there, and it's going to impact some legal rights and responsibilities where I would highly encourage you to have a discussion with Corporation Council if that situation arises. All right. Um, assuming you have a main motion, Andy, someone moves to amend the motion, which is then seconded and restated by the chair, and discussion begins. Can anyone then move to make a secondary amendment to the motion or does it need to be someone who made the main motion or move to amend the motion? Yeah, you can, you can make two amendments to an original main motion. And so think about it as going up and down steps and you have to take care of the steps that are in between before you take care of other steps. So let's just use the example, move to the county purchase a highway truck. I move to amend that motion to the county purchase a red highway truck. It would be in order for another amendment to come in and say, I want that truck to be blue. So strike the word red and insert blue. You have to get rid of the blue before you go back up to the red, before you go back up to the original main motion of purchasing a highway truck. Let's say another example, I move that we purchase a highway truck, move to amend that it be a red highway truck, move to amend that we buy a police car. That amendment is completely contrary to not only the amendment, but also the original main motion. So it's out of order, okay? So think about it in steps and you always have to dispose of each and every step as you go up and down those steps. And just to clarify, Andy, I don't have to be the maker of the main motion no. or the amendment in order to any supervisor can make the motion. Correct. All right, a few more questions here. Some of these are quick. Can a governing body gather in a work session without posting an agenda? No. See, that was quick. Um, what about having two public comment periods on each county board agenda, one for agenda items and the second for general comments not related to agenda items? You're asking for a long meeting. You can do that, but you're asking for a long meeting. And then you're opening it up on the second public comment on matters, anything under the sun, you're opening it up to what I view to be some problems. Um, but again, that's up to you if that's what you want to do. Okay, and I think our previous question answered this question. Can a second amendment be entertained while there is already an amendment on the floor? This yes. would be from a supervisor other than the supervisor that made the original amendment. Yeah, that's correct. Yes. All right, we have two more questions. Motion to postpone an issue to the next meeting. Can this be made prior to the main motion? If not, what should the main motion be? You have nothing to postpone unless there's a main motion pending. So the main motion is pending, and then it's in order to ask that consideration of that motion be postponed to the next meeting. So you cannot make a motion to postpone in advance of the original main motion. So again, remember, when you look at that order of precedence, the very bottom is this original main motion. That concept, that has to be on the floor in order to make all of the motions that fall above it. All right. And then the last question that was submitted. If one has a conflict of interest, is it still permissible to ask a question during debate in order to clarify the issue for the body? Yes, but be very careful about that because again, consult with corporation counsel on ethics and conflicts of interest issues. Your corporation counsel holds a very important get out of jail free card. And so if corporation counsel says, you need to abstain from all debate, all discussion and voting on a particular issue, if you, as soon as you raise your hand and get recognized, you're violating corporation counsel's advice and you have no right to that get out of jail free card. And so be very, very careful about how you deal with that. I don't care about your interests. You may have the purest of interests at heart and that's great. But if again, you're not following corporation counsel's advice, that's a problem. So 
follow that advice and be very, very judicious and cautious about um, just trying to clarify and help people in that circumstance because conflict of interest and ethics issues are, are really, really important. And I'd hate to see somebody get in trouble when they're just trying to help. All right, that's all the questions we have for this morning. Andy, do you have any final final comments, words of no. wisdom? What I'm hoping is that everybody, again, leaves today with an understanding of some of the terminology and how Parley Pro works. Remember, it's a shield, not a sword. And so it's okay to take your time. It's okay to ask questions. And Robert's Rules recognizes the ability to take your time and ask these questions. Okay, so just make sure that whatever you do, you're you're making sure you understand what is happening during a meeting, the rules or procedure that are applicable. And again, if you don't know, it's okay. You can ask questions, but otherwise I appreciate the interest in this. I'm sure it's a topic that we'll be addressing again in the future. And so if you have issues, questions, concerns, topics you'd like to see us address, absolutely feel free to send those on to Sarah and the counties association. We'll do what we can to get you the information. All right, then I think that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you so much for your participation. And again, as Andy stated, at any time, if you have any additional questions with regard to Robert's Rules um, or Rules of Order in general, please feel free to contact our office and we'll be sure to get on an answer back to you. So again, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your week. Thank you.